A river comes back to life, and the world is still watching. It's just the, the, uh, the level of the recovery that has been uh, surprising. The Kennebec River one year later, after the Edwards Dam. Maine Watch is next. For all the people of Maine, this is Maine Watch, Maine's only statewide issues and debate program. Welcome to Maine Watch. I'm Don Kerrigan. Hydroelectric dams have played a critical role in the growth and development of the state of Maine, and many of those dams, of course, are still very important. But a lot of people decided the old Edwards Dam on the Kennebec River in Augusta was not. Just over a year ago, July 1st of 99, we all stood on the banks of the Kennebec and watched the dam disappear. The removal of the Edwards Dam was a big event, and it was noticed by people all over the country. Today, they're noticing the remarkable rebirth of that section of the Kennebec that was behind the Edwards Dam. Maine Watch reporter Barbara Caridi took a canoe trip down the river to see the results firsthand. And Barbara, it seems that no one really has any fault to find with this. Well, not that I could find anyway, Don. We were there on a rainy weekday and we found lots of boaters, anglers, and outdoor enthusiasts out enjoying the Kennebec. All of them said they were pleased and surprised at how quickly the river has come back to life. We've got about 50 times the abundance of, uh, of uh, bug life. Betsy Ham has spent a lot of time on the Kennebec River. As a member of the Kennebec Coalition, Ham lobbied for 10 years to free this 17-mile stretch of river from the confines of the Edwards Dam. Betsy Ham was among those cheering last year when the 162-year-old dam was finally breached. The event made history. It was the first time a dam had been removed against the wishes of its owners. Ham says it didn't take long for the river to spring back to life. It's just the, the, uh, the level of the recovery that has been uh, surprising. Uh, the amount of fish, the number of sturgeon you see leaping, the, the, uh, the return of the striped bass in, in healthy numbers. Someone caught a 40-pound striped bass uh, down in, uh, I believe, in Sydney, but on this stretch of the river. People are returning, too. These kids from the Belgrade Bible Church are honing their paddling skills as part of the church's outdoor adventure week. There's like blue herons and we saw a bunch of hawks, all kinds of fish. We saw a big one jump. I mean, this river is, it's just wonderful to do things on fishing, kayaking, canoeing, boating. It's just really nice. Chaperones Ed and Elizabeth Charles say it's the first time they've held outdoor adventure week here on the Kennebec. Now you have the ability to, to paddle the river uh, in an environment that is enhanced by all the sea run uh, fish that are, are coming up. You hear the kids talking about the schools of fish that they're paddling through. Yesterday was our fly fishing day. We taught the kids uh, how to cast and how to present and different uh, uh, information about the equipment. That dam removal created all of that. Now we have more lessons that we, we're trying to teach these guys how to read the water here on the river, but also in life, how to watch for those things, those obstacles that might trip them up, how to lean t downstream the whole time, no matter if you hit the rocks or not, you want to make sure you don't flip over. So a lot of parallels in life that we see on the river now that wasn't here before. For others, it's a place to enjoy the simple pleasures of fishing. Michael Jones of Aardvark Outfitters in Farmington guides anglers down the river in these graceful drift boats. But John's uh, never fished the Kennebec before, and he's, no. uh, he's fished a lot of the classic rivers in the Northeast, and he wanted, he'd heard about Edwards coming out, and he wanted to know what this was all about, and he decided to come up and do it. Jones says the fishing is now so good, he can guarantee John a bite here at swift-moving Six Mile Falls. Some of the biggest changes on the Kennebec will be seen downstream here in Augusta, where the Edwards Dam used to cross the river. What removal of the dam has signaled is really a rebirth of the community here. David Bolter is with the Riverfront Improvement District, created by the legislature to redevelop this former industrial site. 
But what the board envisions is a waterfront park where people can come down and use this area, whether to just sightsee or to canoe or to fish. There are opportunities, I think, we'd like to explore for actually having some mixed use, some housing down above the floodplain but near, so we can actually complete the physical connection of the community to the waterfront itself. Bolter says the transformation is expected to take about three years. It will take the river some time to fully recover, too. Betsy Ham says these bits of foam floating on the water are a sign that there's more work to be done. From the pulp mill, well, and probably, in fairness, other sources of pollution, at least on the Savastica, it still needs help from us. Like the Kennebec, most major rivers in Maine are still being put to work, generating power. Ham says that's not likely to change, but she says there is a lesson to be learned from the remarkable rebirth of this stretch of the Kennebec. We should, I think, look at each dam. Uh, each, each river is its, has its own story. Uh, each, each dam has, has its own uh, cost-benefit analysis, if you will, uh, with the environment figured in. And so, yes, we should, we should be looking at each dam carefully. Ham says if anyone has doubts about the benefits of that, they should take a trip down the Kennebec. When you let uh, nature uh, take its course, when you, when you give it a little bit of a helping hand and then sit back and, and uh, let, it, let it do its job, it will uh, start to heal it. The city of Augusta did lose some tax revenue when the Edwards Dam was removed, but city officials told me they expect that to be offset eventually by revenues from improvements along the waterfront. Don? Barbara, thank you very much. She gets to go out on the river and I stay here in the studio. So is this a good, as good a thing as it seems to have been, and if so, are more main dams being targeted for removal? Those are some of the things we'd like to talk about in the next few minutes. We're joined by Barbara's River Tour Guide, Betsy Hamm, the Kennebec Coalition, also River Advocate for the Natural Resources Council of Maine, by Steve Brook of the uh, um, group American Rivers, also a longtime advocate for removal of the Edwards Dam. Steve, thank you for being here with us. And George LaPointe, Commissioner of the Department of Marine Resources. Remember that this portion of the Kennebec River we're talking about is still partly tidal. And the uh, DMR is one of the state agencies overseeing the restoration of that part of the river. Steve Brook, let me start with you. Uh, about, gee, three or four days before the Edwards Dam was removed last year, I was out on that river with you, uh, almost within touching distance of the dam for an interview. And uh, forgive me for saying it, but you were almost evangelical in your excitement about uh, getting rid of that dam. Uh, has it turned out the way you thought it would? It really has, Don. In fact, it's, it's been a surprise in terms of how well it's turned out. Uh, I, I can't think of a single incident or a single issue that, uh, where this river hasn't really exceeded our expectations in the speed that it's come back and in the quality that it's come back with. Uh, I guess the, the, the first question I would ask is why? What, why has this been able to so quickly, seemingly, restore itself to a regular river? I think several things come to play here. It's a, it's a big river. Uh, this is one of the largest dams that's ever been removed. Uh, it's a river that uh, has improved water quality significantly over my lifetime. I can remember when this river was literally so polluted that if you fell into it, the first place that you went was the hospital. That's no longer the case today. And so I think that- what, From years of pollution cleanup and things like that. years of pollution cleanup from the Clean Water Act that really was brought to us by Maine Senator, uh, Senator Edmund Muskie. So I think that uh, the Kennebec has a, a long tradition. Uh, it, it was an enormous fishery resource in the past, and I think it has enormous fishery potential for the future. Uh, it's certainly responded very well so far as we've removed this dam. Mm -hmm. uh, have there been surprises for you? I think the greatest surprise was how rapidly the water quality improved. Uh, Maine's Department of Environmental Protection did water quality samples immediately following the removal of the dam. And within four months, well, in, within two months, the water quality went from non-attainment of the minimum water quality level to a very high water quality B. And this is all based on biological indicators and life that's real life in the river itself. I guess the other uh, sure. change that occurred real quickly that surprised me was the switch from um, 
lake uh, invertebrates to river invertebrates. Uh, the, the so mean, meaning the, to, to use uh, pedestrian language, the I'm kind sorry. of animals in the, in the water changed. Right. Yeah. Uh, caddisflies, I suspect, uh, were a large uh, component of that, but it was, um, as, as somebody has described to me, rather than turning a faucet on, it was like turning a switch. I mean, the response mm. was incredibly quick. Mm. Commissioner LaPointe, let me, let's, let's talk a little bit about, about the fish aspect, because right. an awful lot is being made of this is great fishing opportunities. Right. Um, and should, should everybody be excited about that? I mean, the majority of people aren't going to go to that river and fish. Right. I guess it, it's not only a great fishing experience, it's great fisheries habitat. Uh, if you look at um, the Kennebec, um, including Mary Meeting Bay, is one of the largest estuaries on the East Coast. I mean, it's a phenomenal uh, uh, habitat. And we have species like Atlantic sturgeon and short-nosed sturgeon. We have some, among some of the best populations um, on the East Coast. Both species we're concerned about. And so the response here, uh, because these fish move, will, will help elsewhere as well. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. and uh, again, I guess I ask, from, from the, the point of view of the average person in Maine, so what? Why, why, why should they care? Well, I mean, most people in Maine enjoy outdoor experiences, uh, getting on the water and fishing. And so the, 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 the fact that we have one of the, I think it's one of the 10 best striper fishing spots in the country is, is attractive to people because a lot of people in Maine come to the Kennebec, a lot of people from outside of Maine come to the Kennebec. Um, and my sense from in, in Maine and elsewhere is that people like to know that we're doing good things for the environment. Uh, and and as, as was mentioned uh, in the, the clip at the beginning of the show, uh, this has been good for the environment. This has been a great collaborative effort to, to uh, open up the Edwards Dam and, and restore the Kennebec. Mm -hmm. And it's, and it's more than just a, a fishing experience out there, as you could clearly see from the clip, uh, in that uh, kids are out there enjoying the rivers, and a lot of those kids, I believe, are out there for the first time, out just having a river experience. And uh, to be able to give that to our children and our grandchildren, uh, even if some of us in Maine don't actually get out there, to have that there, to have the bird life there, uh, that is so prolific now. Uh, you live and work in the, in the general Augusta area. Obviously, this river is, connects, this section of river connects right. Augusta and Waterville. Yeah. Uh, is it becoming an, an important identity factor for people in that area? Are they really identifying with that and coming to it? I think it is, as, as you heard uh, from uh, David, who works on the Capital River Improvement District uh, on their board. Uh, towns and cities now are turning their face to this river for the first time, are realizing how important it is. And uh, there's, for example, a public meeting next uh, two weeks from now uh, in Augusta to talk about uh, the river and the riverfront uh, and how important that is. And the first few sentences of that uh, notice uh, talk about the importance of this river to that city. And that's uh, just wonderful that communities are really getting involved in this. Let's talk about the hydro aspect of this and, and other dams on the river because, uh, Betsy Ham, you mentioned in the interview on the portion on the river, uh, pointed out that there are other dams upstream that are still obstacles to fish getting higher. And uh, I know that there were some environmental groups uh, last summer at the time of the dam removal that were being very critical of the fact that the owners of those dams weren't being forced to, to do something more quickly. Um, Steve Brook, I'll talk with you, for, I'll, I'll ask you first. Uh, I know that you and American Rivers, uh, for whom you work now, are not big fans of, of dams. Do you want to get rid of more of those dams on the Kennebec? Each dam is unique, and you have to look at dams case by case. There aren't any dams specifically targeted on the Kennebec that we are looking to try to remove. I think that when you look at a dam, you look at the benefit that it provides, and then you have to look at the damage that it does to the ecosystem. And on a case-by-case -case basis, you have to assess whether the, what you're giving up when you build a dam is worth the trade-off of the benefit that you're receiving. At the Edwards site, it was clear that there was not an adequate benefit. There was a very small amount of electricity that was generated at the Edwards site. So on a case-by-case -case basis, you have to assess the value of the dams to the communities today. And remember, many of these dams were built over 100 years ago, and the way we use our rivers has changed dramatically. Yeah, since but these then. dams, but we're, there's, we're still generating electricity for central main power, mm -hmm. for various, for paper mills, uh, and other, other facilities along the river. So they're still, they're still providing important uh, income or offsetting other expenses and providing jobs. It's an unclear how important this can be because there are some dams that are operating at a loss. 
And there are some dams that do more damage than they create benefit for. So you have to examine these on a case-by-case -case basis and understand the trade-off on each one individually. Clearly a dam that is large, that provides an enormous amount of electricity, is very different than a very small dam like the Edwards Dam that provided a very small amount of electricity and did a lot of damage. Betsy Ham, let me get your input on that. What do you think? Well, I think Steve's right. You have to look at this at a case-by-case -case basis. And if you looked at Edwards, it was clear that the power it was providing was minuscule. Uh, and yet, if you looked at that impoundment, and, and that's the interesting thing. I think if you voted on that impoundment before, you'd say, well, it looks okay. Uh, you know, but in truth, it was uh, too deep to be a river system and moving too quickly to be a lake system. It was. Uh, it was a non-functioning piece of water, even though on the surface it looked okay. And that's why you've seen uh, the incredible rebound in water quality, uh, the tremendous comeback in fish and bird life, because now it's functioning as a, as a, as a real system. But the, 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 the other dams, uh, do you, are you taking the same position as, uh, as Steve and American Rivers would? You're not uh, pressuring to, uh, to get rid of any other dams on that river? No, I think that, again, uh, we've been focused on this dam for so right. long that now we need to start to, to take a deep breath and look at all the other dams on the river. Uh, we have provided for fish passage on a lot of these dams uh, already coming up, uh, and that'll be an important aspect. And uh, anywhere in the state where we can start to work collaboratively collaboratively with individuals. Uh, many dams are tiny dams, uh, but it doesn't take very much to block a river. And in those cases uh, where the dam owners want them out and uh, we can work with them, that is uh, a wonderful opportunity and we should not pass up. That. Commissioner Lapointe, uh, the part of the whole package that involved the Edwards Dam were agreements with those dam owners to put in years. fish passage uh, upstream. After 10 years, is that not correct? It's on a case-by-case -case basis. Right. Each of the upstream dams has agreed to the installation of fish passage with certain trigger mechanisms right. that really go back to the fishery that's present in the river. Trigger mechanisms meaning when, that would, when it would happen. That's right. exactly correct. So that they're based on the biological capacity of the river to build the fishery populations to populate the section of the river below the dam. Uh, for example... So when, when there are enough, uh, forgive me for trying to move this along, we've got about four and a half minutes, so that when there's enough of a certain species of fish that need it, that's they'll correct. put it in. Exactly. That's correct. Although the first dam on the Sebastocook uh, is, uh, requires fish passage of some sort in 2003. The other interesting thing, I guess, that we'll see um, uh, this year and, and ongoing is uh, my staff and others in the state have been doing assessments to look at what the fish response is going to be. We've all said that it's great. Uh, uh, with sturgeon and striped bass and smelt and alewife and shad. Uh, uh, some people have seen salmon um, uh, in, in Waterville. And, and my staff is out actually counting, so we'll be able to, to get a better idea of what that really means. Mm -hmm. Looks and really good, but they'll be able to tell how really good. Mm -hmm. and, and what would, <coughs> what's the state government position on the idea of further dam removal? We're looking at it case by case, just as, as folks said. Um, clearly, uh, the, the, the benefit of hydro um, is, is, is as you said, I mean, it, it provides power for, for both municipalities and companies and, and paper mills. We need to look at um, the, how those dams produce, uh, what kind of fish resources are possible, um, and what alternatives there are. Mm -hmm. um, how much does the state need to be doing with regard to this section of the Kennebec in, in terms of stocking? I mean, there was, there was a whole plan put into effect That's for right. recovery. Uh, is it, is it uh, is it big enough? Do you need to do? Is there more to do? And is this going to be reaching out into other areas as well? Certainly, that uh, the as as part of this uh, ten-year agreement, there's an aggressive uh, trap and truck. Um, I think I mentioned earlier that um, staff uh, my staff estimated there was two million alewife below the dam in Waterville. Um, 135,000 of those were put on trucks and moved around other parts of the state. We had 30 shad, which we're using as broodstock, um, and so there's there there. Again, it's kind of early to tell how, how that's going, but they're assessing that through the next uh, 10 years uh, to see what kind of response we get uh, from the removal of the dam. Mm -hmm. Steve Brook, let me ask you, there, a lot was made, uh, and, and, and everyone really, a lot was made a, a year ago about the national interest in yes. removal of the Edwards mm -hmm. Dam. Um, and, it, and this was the first time that a dam had been, uh, that the, the federal government had told the owners of a working dam, get rid of it. Uh, 
was the interest simply because it was that unique, or is this going to be something that, that spreads and, and becomes more common around the country? I think what happened was that at Edwards we showed that in fact dams are not forever. Mm -hmm. and We show that if you in fact assess the conditions based on science and potential, uh, you may make a decision that you wouldn't have 20 years ago. And I think that again it's a case by case basis. Now nationwide people understand that dams are not forever. People understand that dams can do an enormous amount of damage to a river's ecosystem, and they want to understand where the trade-off is and understand where the balance needs to be on a case-by-case -case basis. Be but, before uh, Edwards, uh, I really don't think that in general we assessed dams in a, in a fair manner. We really didn't look at that strongly at the environmental end of things. Edwards gave us the opportunity to really do that, to really and fairly look at each dam to see if it's if it's appropriate to lead Does that mean the that the people who own dams are they a lot more uneasy than they would have been? I think it probably depends on the ownership. Uh, some dam owners some dams aren't making money. Some dam owners would be very happy to get uh, to have those dams and the liability that's associated with that dam removed. So once again it depends on the situation. And Commissioner, we've got less than a minute. Uh, what do you see four or five years from now this section of river being like? It would be like all the rest of the Kennebec? I haven't seen enough of the Kennebec to know what all the rest looks like. I've just seen spots. Um, I, I suspect um, we'll, we'll continue to see changes um, in, in, uh, in the fish uh, response to not as, as dramatic, but some, some responses to the fish. I suspect we'll see the banks uh, vegetate in. Um, and because, as Steve said, we've made a lot of water quality improvements, uh, I, I don't know how much change we'll see beyond incremental changes. So if, if folks float the river now or fish the river now compared to five years, um, it might be a little better. Uh, it might be very close, but it's, it's, uh, where it's really close to where it should be, I think. Okay. All right. That's all the time we have. Thank you all very much. Thank to get you, more Eric. information on the, uh, the latest on the Edwards Dam or to contact the guests on our program, you can go to our Main Watch webpage. That's www.mpbc.org and then click on Main Watch. As we've mentioned, some people were sad to lose the history associated with the Edwards Dam. But as Main Watch commentator Jim Brunel points out to us, they also got something in return. Here's Jim. It's no coincidence that the cities and towns of America grew up along its riverbanks. The rivers provided the basics, irrigation, transportation, and power. They supplied the power to drive our mills, and throughout the 20th century, muscle power and illumination of hydroelectricity. Controlling that power required the building of dams. There were, of course, some environmentally damaging consequences, but these were offset a hundredfold by the rewards of harnessed power. So the removal of dams today, even ones that have outgrown any practical use, is no small thing from a cultural standpoint. It involves not just the dismantling of a simple structure, but the demolition of an important piece of our history as well. And it's hard because it goes against the preservationist instincts of our time. Removal of the Edwards Dam affected nearly a century and a half of history in the Kennebec Valley. That's one way of looking at it. Another way is to view it as restoration, giving history a second chance. That's apparently what's happening here. Removal of Edwards Dam has allowed a sizable section of the Kennebec to recapture a natural integrity that can only enhance the historical development of the communities along its banks. And now it's your turn. What do you think a year later about the removal of the Edwards Dam and about the future of other dams in the state of Maine? You can call our viewer comment line at 800-884-1717. You can write to us at 1450 Lisbon Street, Lewiston, Maine, 04240. Or you can email us at mainwatch at mpbc.org. Please be sure to include your name and where you live and your phone number so we can use your comments on the air. We heard some interesting comments following last week's program about global, global warming and its potential effects on climate and other changes here in the state of Maine. Here's a sample. I'm a scientist and I follow the global warming debate. And what you find is that there's two camps. There's either people that solidly believe it or people that don't. And tonight it appeared you had all the people who do. Uh, in another show, I hope that you show the other side of the story. The prudent thing to do when someone cries wolf 
even if they have done so repeatedly, is to check it out and to monitor the situation. One should never, however, buy wolf insurance from the boy who cries wolf, and I think that applies to the global warming situation perfectly. And Bob Cummings of uh, Phippsburg uh, wrote to us by email to uh, take issue with Jim Brunel for saying that the experts can be wrong as they were about the Y2K problems. He writes, sorry, Jim, the experts said Y2K problems were a myth. It was the fringe that predicted problems. The only unanswered questions is whether the experts would have resolved the potential problems had not the fringe raised the issue since we no longer have anyone truly covering the important questions in Maine, including public broadcasting, we probably will never know. That's Maine Watch for this week. We uh, thank our guests for joining us in the program, and thanks to you for watching. We'll be back next week. I'm Don Carrigan for Barbara Caridi and the Maine Watch team. Good night.